thank you very much. So, the um, purpose of this talk is, is to give an overview of how quantum information changes the landscape in cryptography without taking uh, a priori knowledge of either field from you. Um, so it's going to be a high-level talk. And I start with saying a few words about cryptography in general. Uh, cryptography has been around for a long time. It's, it's an ongoing battle. Uh, it's been going on for thousands of years between, you've guessed it, code makers and code breakers. Uh, you could also think of it as a battle between, uh, sorry, when they, they, technically they're called cryptographers and cryptanalysts, but I will keep calling them code makers and code breakers in this talk uh, because it's more cool, uh, <laughs> even though technically uh, that would be something different. All right. Um, it's also a, a, a battle between good and evil. Um, I'm on the side of privacy, personally. Uh, and, and, and my purpose is to fight against this. Um, uh, if you don't <laughs> so if you don't see why it's funny, I don't, uh, there's no point explaining. But, <laughs> but it's a real picture in, in the uh, Barcelona, near Barcelona town hall. City Hall, I mean. Uh, it's, um, well, look, I, 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 I believe that privacy is worth fighting for. And, and from that perspective, I, I'm on the side of code makers. However, this is a talk, it's a colloquium in honor of Tut. Uh, so it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's legitimate, it's legitimate to, to so in, in, in some cases, uh, good, is <laughs> good is good is in the side of, on the side of cryptographers and evil on the side of code makers. Uh, <laughs> in, 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 in this case, it's giving this guy too much honor. Um, so yes, I, I, I recognize that code breaking is, is an honorable discipline. And, and it, it's not necessarily evil. Uh, but uh, in any case, it doesn't matter. In this talk, I'm not going to take sides anymore. Uh, it's going to be uh, a general talk on, on how qu quantum information, on which side uh, does it help? Does, does quantum information, is it good for code makers or code breakers, essentially, w w without any judgment value? So uh, before that, let's note that uh, privacy, I mean, code, code breakers, could invade our privacy, but if we give it away anyways, it doesn't matter very much. Uh, so unfortunately, in our society, some people say privacy is dead already, and it's not because of code breakers. <laughs> um, let's put that aside as well. Good. So I'm talking about this kind of cryptography, where you have two people, codenamed Alice and Bob, and they, they have some, some private business to discuss. And Alice and Bob, they talk uh, over an insecure channel. It could be the telephone. It could be the internet. They could just be shouting. And, uh, and there is this, this evil uh, code breaker or eavesdropper who wants to know what you're talking about and cannot figure it out because they are speaking in code. Uh, specifically, they are. And the way they do that usually is, is by using a key. So in most cryptographic uh, applications for the purpose of private communication, because there is a lot more cryptography than private communication, in this talk, we restrict to private communication. So for most applications, Alice and Bob will share a key, which is some secret information. And they use the secret information to encipher and decipher information. So Alice, Bob in this case, knows what he wants to tell something to Alice, so he will use his key and through some mathematical transformation, take his clear text message, take the key, and produce ciphertext. And, the, and, and, Eve, uh, sorry, and, and Alice, knowing the key, will be able to decipher and know what Bob is saying, and he can talk back and forth. An eavesdropper, not knowing the key, we hope, will not be able to understand. So uh, really, the problem of cryptography or of secret communication, it boils down to two completely different 
sub problems. One is if Alice and Bob share a secret key, how can they use it to encipher and decipher information in such a way that an eavesdropper who, it, who intercepts the entire uh, uh, cryptid information but does not have the key cannot understand? So that's one issue. And the other issue is how do they get the key in the first place? How is it possible for Alice and Bob to have a secret key? So how to get a key and how to use it are the two questions. Okay. Uh, we're going to assume, as, as is a good cryptographic uh, technique, that there's no secret about the enciphering, deciphering procedure. The only secret is about the key. So the eavesdropper knows exactly how Alice and Bob used that key to encipher and decipher, just does not know the key. Um, and now the question is who will win? So, Code makers or code breakers? This question has been around for a very long time. And uh, I like to uh, give the opinion of a non scientist, a novelist, Poe, Edgar Allan Poe, a, a 19th century American novelist who wrote really, really well known short stories. In particular, in particular he wrote The Gold Bug. The Gold Bug is a, is a short story which revolves around a cryptogram that the hero finds, and, and, in, and pages and pages are taken to explain how it was deciphered in a way that's really entertaining. Uh, and in fact, this was very, a very influential short story. Some real life, uh, very, very high level cryptographers and cryptanalysts were inspired to go into cryptography from reading the gold bug, including Friedman. And, uh, well, Poe, again, was not a scientist, but he was a high-level amateur cryptanalyst, code breaker. And, and he had his opinion. His opinion was, uh, let me quote him exactly from a strangely named magazine where he was writing that. But uh, in 1841, Poe said or wrote, it may be roundly asserted that human ingenuity cannot concoct a cipher which human ingenuity cannot resolve, said otherwise, code breakers will always win. No matter how clever you are at code making, they will be a more clever than you code breaker. So that was Poe's uh, uh, belief. He believed that because he was so good at code breaking, uh, because he, uh, he, he, he had uh, an ongoing challenge to his readers uh, who would send him cryptograms that he would break by next day. And he almost always succeeded. This being said, to write such a statement in 1841 uh, was a bit outrageous because there was, you know, see, there, there, there was a, a cipher system that was invented, sorry, wrong way, invented by Giovann Battista Bellasso in 1553 and was still unresolved to that date. I mean, in 1841. Uh, this is something you may have heard of under the name of the Visionnaire Cipher, also known as the Chiffre Indéchiffrable. Uh, it was not invented by Visionnaire. It was reinvented, possibly independently. But uh, really, it, it goes back to 1553. And the uh, Chiffre Indéchiffrable had been undeciphered, unbroken for almost 300 years when Poe wrote this statement. Turned out it was broken a few years later, but Poe could not know that. It was broken by none else than Charles Babbage, uh, about, well, 13 years after Poe's statement. And if you look into uh, Babbage's handwritten notes, it seems that he had found a way to break it already uh, only five years after Poe's statement. But in any case, when Poe wrote that, it was outrageous. Nevertheless, he was right that, uh, uh, a few years after he wrote that, all systems that had ever, ever been proposed had been broken, which is a good reason to think that it's going to continue that way. But was he right? Was he right that as history will evolve, it will always be the case that no matter how clever the code makers are, code breakers will win at the end? And the purpose of this talk is to address this issue. Who is going to win in a quantum world? Uh, 
Now, at the beginning, not at the beginning of crypto, crypto is thousands of years old, but at the beginning of, of mathematical cryptography, uh, crypto was given its, its first formal mathematical treatment by Shannon, Claude Shannon, the inventor of information theory. Um, and so that was in, in the late 1940s. In the late 1940s, Shannon laid out all the foundations of cryptography based on his own information theory. And, and he defined what it means to be perfectly secret, and defined all kinds of things. He proved all kinds of theorems. It's very, 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 very good and clever work. Uh, however, Shannon's work was based on his own information theory, which itself is based on classical physics. Uh, again, that was in, in, in the 1940s. At that time, uh, we already knew that the world is not classical. Um, so we live in a world, at the best, to the best of our knowledge, maybe we still have not understood, but to the best of our knowledge, uh, our world is, is ruled by, by laws that are different from classical physics of Newton, um, namely quantum physics. And Shannon knew that, certainly, but didn't think that it was relevant to cryptography or didn't think it was relevant to information theory, which he thought of as being pure math, actually. And why should pure math be dependent on physics, after all? Nevertheless, the big question that we address today is that, all right, let's accept that we live in a quantum world. Again, we don't have any proof of that. There might be a new theory coming up which will strike that down and we have to start over again. That could happen. But for today, let's assume that it's correct, that we live in a quantum world. And you don't need to know what that means to follow this talk. So we live in a quantum world. And, and the question is that, is that a blessing for, for, is that a blessing for code makers uh, or, or a curse? So is the fact that we live in a quantum world, for, is it good for code makers or for code breakers, essentially? That's, that's the question for today. And um, well, to answer this question, we have to investigate various scenarios about who is quantum, who is classical. For instance, Code makers could restrict themselves to using old technology that Newton would have understood uh, based on classical physics. And that includes supercomputers. Um, or uh, code makers could be allowed or have the technology to harness this new second quantum revolution that we're working on here in particular uh, at IQC. Um, so code makers maybe could use quantum computing or, or quantum powers of some sort. The same question applies to code breakers, although uh, it, it, history teaches us that code breakers are usually more powerful than code makers in terms of technology. So it's not very interesting to see what happens if code makers are quantum and code breakers are classical. But logically, it is one of the possibilities. But also, the channel that Alice and Bob used to communicate, this channel could be quantum or classical as well. And that also makes a difference. So as you, oops, more wrong way, sorry. So, uh, so as you see, this gives us eight scenarios, mixing, mixing and matching classical and quantum for the three parameters. Um, and of all these scenarios, the one that's been studied for thousands of years is the old classical scenario. And in that scenario, the one that was studied by Shannon, in that scenario, the world, in a sense, was sort of simple. I mean, it's sort of. There are lots of things that are complicated in classical crypto. But it's sort of simple from one perspective, which is that there is a way to, do perf to, to achieve perfect secrecy it's known as a one-time pad. It's been known since the 19th century, even though most people think it's 1918, 1919. No, no, it was known in the 19th century. Uh, and, and the one-time pad is, is a perfect solution. It, it, it gives perfect secrecy. Um, and the way it works, it, it, it requires that a shared random secret key between Alice and Bob, unknown to the eavesdropper. And that key has to be as long as the message they want to transmit and use only once. So it's not very practical, but it depends on the application. The point is that it is 
provably unconditionally perfectly secure, as proven by Shannon. Um, now, to be just technically more correct, as long not as the message, but the entropy of the message. But it's the technicality. Um, and when I say perfect, or when Shannon says perfect secrecy, what it means, in my perspective, what it means is that it means several things. It means that no information leaks about the clear text. So if the eavesdropper intercepts the ciphertext, the coded message, there's no information that leaks about the clear text, except perhaps its length, how many bits. Uh, except who's talking to whom. That's not what we're trying to hide here. There are other techniques for that, but not for today. So here we, are, we only want to, to hide the contents. And technically speaking, not the length, because we count. Uh, but except for that, no information leaks about the clear text. And then we want the system to resist unlimited computing power, even exponential computing power, even quantum, compu even quantum computing power, even infinite computing power. And, and if you know, if you're familiar with, with current day public cryptography, that rules it out. With public cryptography, cannot by definition uh, offer protection against unlimited computing power. So that does not mean it's not useful, not good. It means it cannot be perfect by that definition. I also want it to resist unlimited technology. So unlimited technology and computing power. Now, when I say unlimited technology, you have to understand that it is limited by the laws of physics, uh, but nothing else. Or, excuse me, by the known laws of physics, because we can't do better. Um, and moreover, we want to be able to prove Security. So we want a system for which we can prove that it's going to resist forever unlimited technology, unlimited computing power. That's what perfect secrecy means. And that's what the one-time pad offers. So the one-time pad is a very, very simple system. Again, invent, invented in the 19th century. And Visionaire uh, came very close. The chiffre and chiffrable came very, very close to the one-time pad. It missed, it missed only by one crucial aspect. So it could, have been in, 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 it could have been invented in the 16th century. Um, here it goes. This is, this is the secret key. Alice and Bob share this secret key. Think of each pixel as being zero, black or white, meaning zero or one. So Alice and Bob share this secret key. Now Alice wants to send a message to Bob. She takes her clear text. She takes the key. And by mixing them together through a very simple mathematical operation, she produces a ciphertext. Don't blink. That's the key, and now that's the ciphertext. Bob, now I need to drop, and she sends that to Bob. She sends the ciphertext to Bob. Now, Bob, uh, now the, an eavesdropper might intercept, an eavesdropper might learn the entire contents of the ciphertext, and he would still have no information about the clear text, except how many bits. However, Alice knows the key. Again, this is the key. Alice has the key already, and she receives the ciphertext from Bob. And all she has to do is she, puts, she stacks them together. This was much more uh, uh, convincing in the old days of, of overhead projectors when I had actual transparencies I could stack. Before, right? So it's kind of not so nice anymore to do this. But, but if you, believe me, if, 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 if you were to stack uh, these two things, um, you'd get this. So if, you, so if you stack this and that, you get this. Uh, Vernam, which used to be thought as the name of the inventor of the one-time pad. As it turns out, it was invented about 30 years earlier by, by a banker. Um, but so the one time pad is perfect. Um, it was used in real life. For instance, that's the, 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 the red telephone during, during the Cold War, the red telephone between Khrushchev and Kennedy was enciphered by a one time pad. So it's been used in real life for high level, high power uh, situations. Uh, by the way, the red telephone, this famous red telephone, was neither red nor a telephone. <laughs> but, but it was encrypted by the one-time pad. <laughs> and, and, uh, and in those days, in those days um, the key, see, so you, you, need a, you, you need a secret key as long as a message. This sounds silly. I mean, if, if you have a way to transmit securely a secret key as long as a message, why don't you use the same way to send a message? It sounds totally silly, but it's not. Because the key can be transmitted at a time when you have access to a secure channel, 
Whereas the message, when, when the contents of that message is ready to be sent, you no longer have access to, to that channel. And the way that this one time pad for the red telephone, the way it was used in real life, is that you had a diplomat. So, so one side or the other would generate a bunch of random bits, would put on a magnetic tape, put the tape in a briefcase, and close the briefcase, lock it, and strap with the handcuffs to a diplomat who would take the airplane and deliver the key from between Washington and Moscow. Uh, at that time, when the key was transmitted, neither Khrushchev nor Kennedy, Kennedy knew what they wanted to tell the other. Later, when the key is received, either one can use this secret key to transmit a new message, a new clear text. So it makes perfect sense in high security, for high security business to use this one-time pad. But it requires a whole lot of key. Again, you, you need one bit of key per bit of message, and you can use it only once. Uh, by the way, if you have a very long key, of course you can break it into chunks. You, you, can send you, can use it, you can use the same key for many messages by using several disjoint portions of the key for, for each message. So it's not only one message. It's as many bits of message altogether as you have bits of key. Uh, but you need a, a whole lot of key to, do, to use that. And the question is, how can this key be transmitted? So I remind you that, it, that, that really cryptography boils down to two questions. How do you use the key? How do you get the key? And how do you use the key? The answer is plain and simple, one time pad. It, it, there's no better way, if, if you insist on perfect secrecy. If you're not so paranoid, then there are, there are ways that may be less uh, uh, more economical in terms of amount of key. But if you want perfect secrecy, there's, there's no better choice than, than a one-time pad. So that's how you use it. And then the other question, how do you get the key? Uh, and how do you get the key is, is known as the key establishment problem. And this talk is more about key establishment, because once you establish the key again, just use a one-time pad that's solved, problem solved. But how do you establish the key? And there are essentially three ways. You, you can put, establish a key, a secret between this and Bob. You could use a trusted courier. That's the diplomat used during the Cold War. And I will say no more about it, because it's not very interesting, mathematically speaking. But it has been used for real. Or you could use, use computational complexity, in which uh, you do something that gives the eavesdropper all the information about the key, but in a way that you hope will require too much computing power to extract. This is what's used in real life today. All the public key cryptography is based on that. But by definition, computational security, key establishment, by definition, cannot be uh, perfect. By this definition of perfect, that it should resist unlimited computing power. Or you could use quantum physics. Um, let me first uh, concentrate on, on the, on the competition complexity, because all, there are really interesting things to see here. It cannot be perfect, but still the, 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 there are good issues here. And let me start with the history. Uh, who invented the idea that you could base the security of key establishment on computational complexity, on the, on the difficulty of computing problems? Um, well, most people attribute this to, I'm sorry, let me first tell you what, what I mean exactly. What I mean exactly, the key establishment problem, you have Alice and Bob. Alice and Bob, they have their computers, classical computers, and they're going to exchange information. So we're going to assume that Alice and Bob have a channel between them. This channel is public. By public, I mean that there is no protection against eavesdropping. But it's also, it will also be authenticated, by which I mean that uh, the information cannot be modified by an eavesdropper or by a tamperer, and that Alice knows when she gets something that it comes from Bob and has not been altered in transit and vice versa. So we're going to assume an authenticated channel between Alice and Bob, uh, because if you don't have that, there's no solution. If you don't have that, you can always have an eavesdropper who comes in between. No matter what's your protocol, if Alice and Bob have no way to authenticate each other, if they are complete strangers, then the eavesdropper in, in the middle can play the, play the protocol with Alice, pretending to be Bob, and with Bob, pretending to be Alice, 
And at the end, the eavesdropper has a secret key with Alice and a secret key with Bob. And for some protocols, the eavesdropper can even rig the system to get the same key with both of them. Not always, depends on the protocol. But in, in either case, Alice and Bob think that they, that, they, that they have established a secret key between them, then they haven't. Then the only way to, to, to avoid that is, 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 is that there must be some, some way for Alice and Bob to know that they're actually talking to the right person. That's why we need authentication. Now, the good news is that whereas Shannon proved that for perfect secrecy, I guess I didn't mention that, Shannon proved that one time it is perfect. I said that. He also proved that to get perfect secrecy, you need a key as long as the entropy of the message. In other words, Shannon proved that a one time pad is optimal. Uh, so you need a very long secret key to get uh, perfect secrecy for communication. But somewhat miraculously, there are perfect authentication schemes that work on much shorter secret keys. So a short secret key is, is enough to get perfect authentication, whereas it's not good enough to get perfect secrecy. And therefore, if Alice and Bob have a short secret key ahead of time, they can use it to authenticate their messages and possibly then get, get a longer secret key at the end. So we're talking more, more about secret key uh, um, expansion than creation from nothing. Or maybe Alice and Bob have some other way to authenticate other than these uh, uh, secret key versions. But no matter how they do it, Alice and Bob will need to be able to authenticate. So we're going to take that for granted. They have this authenticated public channel, they exchange information, and at the end of the process, they have obtained some secret S, some key. S has to be the same for both of them. And uh, there is this eavesdropper who taps the channel uh, because it's, it's public channel. There's no protection against eavesdropping. And at the end of the day, what we want is that the eavesdropper will not be able to know what the key is, even though he's heard everything that, that Alice and Bob have told each other. That, so, if you've never seen that, it sounds like black magic. right? Alice and Bob, they have no secret initially, except perhaps what they need to authenticate. Uh, they talk. And at the end of the day, someone who listens to the entire conversation cannot figure out the secret that they have obtained. Sounds impossible. Uh, and, and, and to think that this might be possible is a much greater achievement than to find a way to do it, in my opinion. So who was the first person to think that it might be possible? Well, most people uh, would credit that to Diffie and Hellman. In, 19, in 1976, Diffie and Hellman wrote a seminal paper called New Directions in Cryptography, in which they proposed exactly that problem. And they gave a solution. Um, but in fact, uh, and, 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 and then uh, uh, the, the following year, Rivesh and Edelman proposed their, their extremely well-known RSA crypto system. RSA is based on the ideas of Diffie and Hellman with a different implementation, which has some advantages. And then some other ideas came out. Uh, some were broken uh, in shortly afterwards. Uh, Michaelise uh, proposed a system based on coding theory the year after, uh, which um, it turns out that in real life it's RSA and also the, what Diffie Hellman invented. Uh, so both Diffie Hellman and RSA uh, sort of won the battle in the sense of being used in real life, uh, and we still use them today for to secure the internet and all, almost any communication. Yeah. HTTPS is, is secured by that and all that. But Michaelis' system was not uh, chosen because it required longer keys. And in those days, they were already thinking that it would be, it would be cool to, to implement these crypto systems on smart cards, which were, did not quite exist yet. It was an upcoming idea to have smart cards. And wouldn't it be cool to implement crypto on these smart cards? And the amount of memory required for the keys of Michaelis' system was too large for anything conceivable for smart cards in those days. And that's essentially why RSA won. And as you'll see in a moment, that was a disaster for uh, the future of mankind. <laughs> uh, but in fact, before the Finland, there was Merkel. Uh, Merkel invented both the key establishment uh, idea, gave a solution, and invented a notion of public cryptography without giving a solution. 
1974. And before that, Ellis, John Ellis uh, and Cliff Cox, well, Ellis invented, as far as we know, Ellis is the first person, unless someone else comes out of the woodworks. Uh, but Ellis, as far as we know, in, is the first person who have thought that it's possible for two people to establish a secret key by public communication. He was working at a time uh, at uh, CGHQ, the uh, British, Se British Secret Services. So he wrote a paper about this, which, which he called the possibility of secure non-secret digital encryption, in which he said that it's generally self-evident that it's necessary to have some initial information known to Alice and Bob, but unknown to the eavesdropper, namely the key. And then he goes on saying maybe it's not necessary. So, so Alice proposed the idea of, of, of the key establishment uh, problem, that it might be possible, and no idea how to do it. Whereas Cox, sorry, whereas Cox, uh, when he came into work at CGHQ a few years later, Cox uh, got, got to read Alice's uh, secret paper. Of course, it was all classified. So God, uh, Cox got to read Alice's paper. He said, oh, that's, that's cool. Uh, he, he went home that night and laid uh, in his bed, thought about it, and then met Orison. Uh, essentially. In, in one night, just after having read the, uh, Alice's idea that it might be possible, well, nobody had any idea at CGSU how, how to do it, uh, Cox figured it out in his head. And, and unfortunately for him, it was, of course, it's not allowed for a, uh, someone who works in secret services when they are not in the secure area to write down anything. So he had to work it out in his head. He was not allowed to write even a single symbol, equation, or anything during that night. And for some reason, the next morning, he came to work quite early. <laughs> so he could write it down and check. And it worked. All right, so that's the history of computational security, computational security uh, key establishment. Sorry about that. Um, but let me tell you more about Merkel. I, uh, in fact, what, what, I'm, what I'm going to describe to you is, is, more, is, is based to a large extent on, on the work of Merkel. 1974, uh, Merkel had these two very bright ideas. One was that it might be conceivable that to, to, to get this a protocol by which two people have no secret initially, they communicate, and then they get a secret. Someone listens to everything, cannot figure it out. So Merkel thought, oh, that might be possible, just as Ellis did four years earlier. And then Merkel found a way to do it. He found the most beautiful way to do it, much more beautiful, than, in my opinion, than RSA, Michaelis, or anything else. Uh, more, more beautiful because more simple. And, and his idea was, Merkel's idea was so simple that it was rejected. Uh, this is it, in six lines. In six lines, uh, th th this, is, this is a uh, proposal that Merkel wrote for a course that he was, he was a graduate student at Berkeley, uh, taking a computer security course. And he wrote a, uh, a report on, 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 on an idea he just had, this idea, seven page report, uh, which unfortunately his professor did not understand and rejected. But, but in six lines, Merkel, explained completely in detail how to do it. And, and I'm, not going to, I'm not going to read this to you because I will show you in more modern terms what he meant. But um, after these six lines, Merkel added one sentence. <laughs> uh, but still it was rejected. <laughs> and then he tried to uh, to publish that in the communication of the ACM, which in those days was the top journal in computer science, maybe still is now, uh, after at some point it was not anymore, but, but at that time and now, a uh, very, very good journal. And so he submitted his idea in 1975 to CACM and got this rejection letter. The rejection letter wrote, in, uh, in 1975, right? So that's before Diffie and Hellman 76. That's the point. 
In 75, not only did he write this course proposal, which was rejected, he submitted to CSEM and got this rejection letter, unable to publish the manuscript. And enclosed is a referral report by an experienced cryptography expert. And here's what the expert wrote. That's the expert. He wrote, I'm sorry to have informed you that the paper is not in the mainstream of present cryptography, cryptography thinking. Correct. Duh. That's why it should be accepted. <laughs> uh, but uh, Merkel kept fighting, and it was eventually published in 78. 78, so uh, after Diffie Hellman, and nobody paid attention because Diffie Hellman was out already. That's kind of sad. Um, the, other, the other thing that is sad is that in order to finally get it accepted, Merkel had to make it much, much more complicated than his initial idea. His initial idea is so beautiful. I'm going to tell you in a minute. It's so extraordinarily beautiful and simple that he could not get that, that published. He had to add all kinds of things to make it more complicated. And then it was finally accepted. It's really very, very sad. So here is his scheme. Here is the original 1974 scheme of Merkel uh, in more modern term than the six line I showed you before. But it's the same thing, essentially. So that, these are the six lines again. In more modern terms, Alice and Bauer had their computers. We're going to assume we're going to work in a model known as the black box model. What it means <coughs> is that we're going to assume that there is some, some black box that computes a function. You put x in, push a button, get f of x. And this function, we, we're not asking anything special about this function, except that there is no way to know anything about it other than the input-output behavior of this black box. So that's why we call it the black box model. There is something inside, but you don't see it. The only way to learn something about f is choose any x you want and get f of x, and then repeat. Now, under this model, if you are given f of x, in order to find x, there might be more than one, but if it's one to one, given f of x, the only way to find the pre-image x is to try, to try inputs either systematically or at random or what have you. But no matter which input you try, when you ask the box and you get some input y and you get f of y and it's not f of x, all you've learned is that x is not y. You know, you've learned nothing about x other than it's not y. Now you try another one and another one and another one. So as you can see, uh, you will need to, to try essentially half, half the, the possibilities. So if, if, if there are n points in the domain of the function, you have to try on the average n over 2 times before you hit the right answer. And there's no, no shortcut by definition of being black box. This is what Merkel called one-way encryption. In his six lines, he talks about one-way encryption. That's what, that's what he meant, that, that, that uh, you, can, you know how to encrypt. That's a black box. But it's one way. You don't know how to decrypt. Or you can, in order to decrypt, there's no other way than exhaustive search. So let's assume that we have this black box function. That's the only assumption. From this only assumption, we can prove security. It is an assumption, but you don't need something else. It's very, uh, it, it, it's a, a simple assumption. And, and then, here it goes. We're going to put n square points in the, in, in the domain. And you'll see why n square in a moment. So we assume there are n square points in the domain of f. Here it goes. Uh, and in fact, I'm, so I'm, I'm about to, to, to tell you a 1974 idea. And, and if you rem take anything home from this talk, let it be it. It's not my idea. It's old. It's beautiful. And it, and it, it can be used at, at, at parties as well. So what Alice does, she's going to choose at random n points. So this function f has n square points in the domain. Alice chooses n points at random in the domain of the function. She calls the function and gets the n images, which she sends to Bob. Now, Bob's purpose will, Bob, Bob will want to invert one of these. He doesn't care which one. So how to do that? It's going to, to take one random element uh, of, of the big X. He wants to find one element of one of those. Right? So the way to do that is going to choose at random, or for random, and it's choose at random some element in the domain of the function and calls, calls the function on it. 
And is f of s one of these points that he received from Alice? Well, what's the probability? There are n square points uh, in that, that Bob can try. Of these n square points, n, those n, are good. So the probability of success is n over n square. Each time that Bob chooses a random s in the domain of f and, and, and ask, computes f of s or asks the box, the probability that it's going to be one of these points is 1 over n. But it's not going to be the first time, unless it's very, very lucky. So he will try again. And he will try again. At some point, he succeeds. And again, each try has probably 1 over n of success. And, and, and that means that the number of the times that you have to try on average is n. Right? The inverse of the probability is the number of tries. So Alice, uh, Bob, Bob will find one of these, one of these pre-images, this one in this case, could be any one of them, after an expected n calls to the function. And that would be the secret. The secret would be xi, whichever one was inverted. Now Alice needs to know. That's obvious. Bob tells Alice which one it is. And Alice knows it. And that's x, that's s. So now Alice and Bob share the, uh, this s, which is xi. And they each had to query this black box about n times, exactly n times for Alice, and an average of n times for Bob. OK. What about an eavesdropper? An eavesdropper sees this. The eavesdropper has access to the black box. It's unfair otherwise. The eavesdropper has seen all these f of x's going to, Al going to Bob. He, the eavesdropper has intercepted them. He knows what they are and knows what i is. So knowing i, the eavesdropper knows that it's this one that must be inverted. And the others have no relevance anymore. They're there, but they're useless. The, the only thing of, of interest for the eavesdropper is to invert this one specifically. And i has no interest either. The only thing that counts is invert this one. But inverting one point takes n squared over 2, as I argued before. So I wrote n squared, but it's really n squared over 2. Uh, and, and it, so the, it's, the crucial thing is to understand where is the advantage of Alice and Bob over the eavesdropper. It, the advantage is that Bob can invert any one of these endpoints. It doesn't matter. Just as good. But once Bob has inverted one, it's this very same that must be inverted by the, by the eavesdropper. And that's much harder. To invert a specific one is much harder than one at random. You don't care which one. And that's what gives the advantage to Alice and Bob. Sorry, I went the wrong way. So the eavesdropper needs n square, whereas Alice and Bob needed n. So that's the quadratic advantage. The eavesdropper has to work quadratically harder than the legitimate parties. Now, if you know RSA, you will say, ha, huh, what a quadratic. RSA gives ex exponential advantage. We don't know that. There's no proof. There's even against a classical computer, there's no proof of security for RSA or D.V. Hellman or Michaelis. Uh, it could be that that you can factor big numbers as efficiently as you can multiply them. Nobody believes that. But it could be on a classical computer. There's, even a classical computer, there, there's no proof otherwise. Whereas this is proven. The security of, of, of Merkle is proven, again, under the assumption that you have these, these, these black boxes or one-way encryption, which is a much more generic in, uh, assumption than the hardness of factoring. All right. Now, let's, uh, so that, that's, that's what I want to say about the classical case. Now, let's see what happens if the code breaker can use quantum powers. And, and that's what we call post-quantum cryptography. Classical crypto, everybody is classical. Post-quantum crypto, uh, the code maker is still classical, but we give quantum powers, quantum computers, to code breakers. And it's reasonable that, that code breakers will have quantum computers available more readily than the, the average citizen in the short term or the medium term. So that's, that's a reasonable scenario. Well. I have to tell you only two things about quantum computers. You've all heard about quantum computers. But uh, all you need to know for this talk is that there are two famous algorithms that have been invented for quantum computers. One is due to Peter Shor, 
who found a way to factor large numbers efficiently. So there's an algorithm on a quantum computer that would factor large numbers uh, as, essentially as quickly as one module exponentiation, as one use of RSA, uh, and much faster than finding an RSA key. Uh, Schwarz algorithm can also extract discrete logarithms, sorry for the jargon. Discrete logarithms, extracting discrete logarithms efficiently is what you need to break the Diffie-Hellman system, 1976. And Schwarz algorithm can also extract logar discrete logarithms efficiently in, in elliptic curves. So that breaks um, something that was developed here by Scott Vanstone um, and, and, and is, was considered for a long time as the most secure type of, of public encryption, elliptic curves, discrete logarithms. But Schwarz algorithm breaks that as well. Uh, but, well, you need a quantum computer. OK. And Grover's algorithm, the other famous quantum algorithm, uh, let's say that you have a, a n points in, as in the domain of an, let's think again about a black box function. It has n points in the domain. And, but it sends out these points to 0, 1. It will send most points are sent to 0. So it's function f here. f will send almost everything to 0. But there's one point sent to 1, and you want to find it. So if it's a black box function like, as before, well, classically, to find this unique x sent to 1 by the function, well, you have to try them, either systematically, or randomly, but no matter how you do it, any y so that f of y is 0 only tells you that this y is not x. You've learned nothing else. So there is no shortcut. You need to try on the average half the inputs before you're lucky. So randomly, classically, you need n over 2 calls. And Grover found how to do it with root n calls. Uh, and the constant here is slightly less than 1. It's pi over 4. Pi over 4 times root n calls. And if there's more than one solution, if there are t solutions, here's only one, but if there are t solutions, t points are sent to 1, and n minus t sent to 0, where t is less than n, much less than n, then a generalization of Grover will take square root of n over t. When t equals 1 is, is, is Grover. When t is bigger, then square root of n over t uh, finds one solution at random among t solutions. All right. That's all you need to know about quantum computing. Well, now let's go back to key establishment. And we change the scenario a little bit. We change the eavesdropper to being a quantum adversary. Some of you might recognize him. <laughs> uh, so now we have a quantum adversary uh, who has uh, access to a quantum computer. And let's see what he can do. Back to Merkel. Well. Um, Using Grover's algorithm, the eavesdropper, this is an old study, I'm sorry, what was sent is i, and so the eavesdropper wants to invert f of xi. So i is sent from Bob to Alice, sorry about that. And f of xi is what the eavesdropper needs to invert. There are n square points in the domain, and there's only one solution. So it takes square root of n square by Grover's algorithm. And square root of n square is n. In fact, it's pi over 4 times n. Pi over 4 is less, pi over 4 is less than 1. So you need less, less queries. The, the quantum eavesdropper needs slightly less than n queries, whereas Bob needed oh, oh whereas Bob needed n, as we see before, so before. So it takes less time to break than to use. That's pretty bad. Complete break. OK. Um, so that's the situation with post-quantum crypto. I'm just showing that Merkel, whom I, I mean, I'm in such admiration for his idea, but it is broken by a quantum computer uh, because, of, because of Grover's algorithm. Of course, the phenomenon is broken by Shor's algorithm, even in elliptic curves. And RSC is broken because you can factor big numbers. And Cox is broken because Cox was RSC after all before the time with a, very, with a slight difference, very slight. Uh, Alice's idea is not broken because Alice had, uh, did not suggest any ways to do it. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, 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 I repeat that the most important step was to recognize that it was worth thinking about this problem. So I'm not saying anything against Alice at all. But he had nothing to be broken. So it was not broken. 
Uh, and and Michaelis, Michaelis, nobody has proposed a way to break it yet. It could be. We have no proofs. But it could be that the Michaelis crypto system, invented at the same time as ours, or just about, is not threatened by quantum computers. That's what I meant earlier. It's a complete disaster that back in the old days, Michaelis was not chosen. If it had been, instead of RSC or Diffie Hellman, we would not be in such trouble today. Because we are in trouble. We are in extreme trouble. Because not only are Diffie Hellman and RSC broken as soon as there's a quantum computer, and you can tell me, ah, oh, the quantum computer, and eh, 20 years, I don't care. Well, um, first, we don't know when there will be one. We don't even know if there is one now. Uh, and I'm not, not talking about D-waves here. Uh, and, uh, but when a quantum computer becomes available, all previous communication encrypted by RS and Diffie Hellman become vulnerable. Because anybody today who has a technology, enough, just enough storage, can take down all the internet traffic, which is encrypted, and, and perhaps they cannot decipher it because it's encrypted with RSA and they don't know how to break it, but still you can take it down. And when a quantum computer is available, you can go back, take out of your disk all the previous communications and decipher them one by one. So classical crypto, the, the, what is used today on the internet, is susceptible to an attack in the future. And that's what makes the situation so dramatic. Because we keep using it, even though we know that at some point, or at least we suspect, we don't know yet for sure, but there's good reason to at least be worried that a quantum computer will come out in not so far future and will be able to decipher all the communications that are sent today and last year. Uh, since, I mean, in the past 35 years, essentially. So it's, it's um, there's reason to worry. There's really reason to worry. And, and that's why uh, we can, it would be good to, to do something. Not necessarily make a lease, because in the meantime, post-quantum crypto has been um, become more and more developed, and other systems have been proposed uh, that could be secure against a quantum computer. We don't know, but, but there are other systems have been developed. The two most famous uh, are codenamed, I'm not joking, New Hope and Frodo. <laughs> uh, New Hope is based on, 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 uh, on an algebraic structure known as a ring, and Frodo gets rid of the ring. <laughs> I'm not making it up. Uh, but in any case, uh, well, Merkle can be saved. In fact, Merkle can be provably saved. And I'm, time is running up. I'm go just going to give you an idea how to do that. Uh, this, is, this is joint work with, with several co-authors. I've been working on that since I think, uh, 2015, uh, no, 2005. It's been about 12 years. And, um, so can Merkle be uh, repaired? Yes. And here's how. Um, really, very really briefly. We start the same way. Remember, Alice, there's this, this one-way this, this, this black box function. Alice uses endpoints at random in the domain, sends the images to Bob. Well, Bob just needs to find two instead of one, as simple as that. If Bob finds two elements, it would just take twice as much time. Does it the same way? It takes random points, and it will probably one over n each time. So after after two n tries, it will get two points essentially, roughly. Now, of course, and, and that's going to be the secret. The two points that that were uh, that, that were inverted by luck will be will, will be the secret. Now, of course, now if Bob were to send Alice i and j, the two now the two indices that were inverted, then and we're using Grover's algorithm, the eavesdropper would invert these two points and it would be none the wiser. So, so we need a different way for Bob to tell Alice which points he's chosen. Or he's not just chosen, he's found by chance. And the idea is that we're going to use a second black box function called T. And what Bob will send Alice is an encoding of S and S prime, the two points that were inverted. Bob will send an encoding of these two points using T in a very simple way, he will apply t to s and s prime, which gives bit strings, and will do the exclusive war bitwise. Right? So 
it doesn't matter what it is exactly. It's some simple function of t of s and t of s prime. That's what Bob sends to Alice. And by getting that, uh, Alice will compute t on all of these points that she's chosen. And now she needs to find two points here that XOR to W. And that, you might think that takes n square time. Because if, if Bob tries every, each pair to find a pair that XORs to W, that would take n square time. But I, I let you do that in homework to find a way to do that in, 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 in linear time, in order n time. In fact, in order n time, you can do that. So in order n time, using this table, Bob finds S and S prime. So both Alice and Bob work at time about n. 2n for Bob, about n for Alice. And what we could prove, uh, and this is by far the hardest part, which I'm not even giving you a glimpse on how to prove that. It's a lower bound that's always harder to prove. But we could prove, first we have, we have, we have an explicit uh, algorithm for the eavesdropper to find S and S prime from W and access to these two functions uh, in the time that I'm going to tell you. And we have a proof that it cannot be done any faster. And so we have provable security because the eavesdropper um, against this scheme probably needs n to the power 7 sixth. Uh, and, and you're allowed to laugh. Uh, n, to, <laughs> n to the 7 sixth. See, n squared, I could argue, I, and, and Merkel did already in 74, I could argue that a quadratic gap n time for Alice and Bob versus n square, for the, n square over 2 for the eavesdropper, I can argue that is, this is practical. If you compute this function in one nanosecond, and Alice and Bob are willing to work for one second each, and if you need the only way to invert the function is exhaustive search, the eavesdropper needs 15 years. So a quadratic gap is practical. There's no way I can argue that a gap from n n76 is practical. But it's a proof of existence. It proves that it's possible to prove uh, a gap between the time taken by the, 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 the time needed by the legitimate party that is in Bob, and to prove that it, it, the eavesdropper needs more time, more than linearly more time. Once, once you have this, it's like taking the first pickle out of the jar. Uh, maybe we can do better. We haven't been able to, but that's for you. OK, so that's the situation for post-quantum crypto. Now we can make the code maker quantum, to be, to, be, to, be, to be fair. It turns out that nobody, as far as I know, has proposed a way to use quantum powers for code making, except what I'm going to show you, uh, like, like to make RSC safer, or make some, something usable safer by using quantum computing for the code makers. It should be possible, but so far nobody has come forward to say, hey, I've got an idea. Except this. Merkle can be made safer. So now we're going to, to uh, uh, the eavesdropper is already quantum. We're going to give quantum powers to listen, Bob. And, and, and now what we can do about, about, about Merkle is that it's, this, is about, this is the same, this is what you've seen already. We're going to increase the uh, domain of, of these two functions from n squared to n cubed points. Because Bob, having a quantum computer, can use Grover himself, or in fact BBHT, to invert one of these points. So we can move from n squared to n cubed, which will make it much harder for the eavesdropper, and still feasible for Bob. So now using BBHT, there are n cubed possibilities of which n are good. So there are n good solutions out of n cubed possibilities. So that takes order n time for a quantum computer on Bob's. So Bob is still order n, and now the eavesdropper has a harder job because of n cubed points. And then the other change is instead of using two points, we find three points. Uh, so we use BBHT three times to find three elements of x, and then the rest is the same. <coughs> That's the secret. Bob sends a bitwise XOR of t of these three points. And now, because Alice has a quantum computer, Alice can invert that. Uh, g given, dub g given this information, given all the possible uh, points here, and given w, which is the XOR of three of them, finding which three will XOR to w uh, with a quantum computer, you can do in linear time. With a classical computer, we don't know how to do it better in, better in quadratic time. But a quantum computer, Alice in linear time, can find the three points at XOR to W. 
And now, it's still order n time for Alice and Bob, but now we can prove that the eavesdropper needs n to the power 7 fourths. And n to the power 7 fourth is getting close to n squared. Now I can argue it's practical. All right. Did I go the wrong way? Oh, but if we care only about the number of queries, not about time, number of queries, if you only care about the number of queries, then, then we're not going to care about how much time it takes for Alice to solve the, the, the final puzzle. Only about how many queries to, to f and t, that doesn't change. So if we only care about the number of queries, not time, then we find, Alice, Bob finds k elements, sends the bitwise XOR of these, and then uh, Alice can solve the problem. Not in order and time anymore, but still order and queries. That's, that's what theorists do. Uh, so it's still order and queries for Alice and Bob, and now it's n to the power 1 plus k over k plus 1 for the eavesdropper. And when k goes to infinity, that's 2. So we get arbitrarily close to n squared. But it's not practical because it's not practical because Alice needs to work a lot in terms of time. Not queries, but time. So for query complexity, we got back n square as we recall had. In practice, it's not useful. All right, summary? Summary? In the unproved security model, uh, in the classical world, our CDP element is seem to be secure. We can't prove it, but it seems to be secure. But against a quantum, in a quantum world, it's all broken completely. It's known to be insecure. So it seems that quantum mechanics is a curse for code makers. And remember the question was, is quantum mechanics a curse or a blessing for code makers? That was the question. It seems that it's a curse for code makers. But there's Michaelis. Michaelis seems to be secure, as far as we know. It might be secure. And, 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 and so is New Hope and Frodo. OK. In the unproved security, so that, that was the unproved security model. I need five more minutes. Um, in the provable model, then if Alice and Bob work for a time in order n, then in classical world, that's Merkel's original. It's n squared for the eavesdropper. Whereas we're able to get n to the power 7 fourths, which is not as good as n squared, but not so bad. But still, it's not as good. So here, again, quantum mechanics is a curse. Because then this is not as good. All quantum is not as good as all classical. But that's the best so far. Maybe there's better. We don't know. All right. And now, very briefly, we move to what happens if the channels are quantum. And that changes the game completely. If we allow the, if we allow the channels to be quantum, then the code makers can even become classical again, almost. So we're back here. Uh, Alice and Bob will send quantum information instead of classical information, like polarized photons. And now they don't need quantum computers anymore. They can have classical computers in a small quantum interface. Just enough to be able to prepare single photons, send them, receive them, measure them. So very simple, quantum, very simple compared to a quantum computer. It's not that simple. But compared to a full-scale quantum computer, it's much, much simpler. And then, uh, but the eavesdropper is, is allowed complete quantum power. And now what we get is quantum cryptography. If Alice sends his message to Bob as, as a quantum signal, then like, like using these four states of polarization, the detail is not important in minus five minutes. But these states, these states cannot be distinguished, even in principle. And because of that, any attempt at an eavesdropper to measure the signal from Alice to Bob will create errors. And these errors can be detected. So that if Alice sends a message to Bob like this, as a quantum signal to Bob, but there's an eavesdropper in the middle who tries to measure it, that would create a disturbance so that what Bob receives is different from what Alice had sent. And that disturbance will be detectable by the proper protocols. Now, I have no intention to describe to you these protocols, uh, known as quantum key distribution, but they exist. Uh, and, um, and, and we're going to use quantum key distribution. <coughs> we're going to use the quantum channel not to send the actual message, which would not be practical because of loss in quantum transmissions. We're going to use the quantum channel to establish a key. So we're back to the key establishment problem. And, and then once a key is established, 
See, uh, errors can be detected on the channel. So if you det so so you can because you can detect errors, you can detect eavesdropping. If all you could do is detect eavesdropping and the actual message, probably better than nothing, but not so good. You don't want to detect eavesdropping. You want to prevent it. So the idea is that you use a quantum channel, as I said, to send to, ex to, to, to establish a key, a secret key, not to send the actual message. So that if you detect eavesdropping in a quantum channel, you know the key is not safe and you don't use it. And the message, you, you, you don't get to send it, but, but at least it's safe. Whereas if you succeed at, at exchanging a secret key, then you use it as a one-time pad to send the actual message. So that's the idea of what's known as BB84. And that gives us unconditional security, and, and probably so, regardless of eavesdropping power, technology, and everything. Uh, be, between the time that uh, Charlie Bennett and I introduced this, this idea and the time it was proven for the first time by my student, Dominic Myers. It took about 10 years. So a complete proof of security took 10 years. It was not so not easy at all, mathematically speaking, but it's the original protocol, 1984. Um, and, and at some point, we, 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 we built this first prototype in 1979, five years after, I, no, no, 89, sorry. Five years after having the idea, we, we built a prototype which, because people didn't take us seriously, uh, our math was perfect. This prototype is somewhat ridiculous, but it was, it was, it was taken seriously. Uh, and uh, in, enough that, 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 that real experimentalists, which we are not, uh, uh, decided to, to, to build better and better and, and long this, longer this and longer. This was 32 centimeters here of secret communication. But, uh, but today, today you can go on the internet, wrong way, uh, and for instance, you can go to ED Quantique in Geneva, and, and you can buy a Alice and Bob's boxes uh, and establish a secret key, establish communication. You can establish communication over 100 kilometers distance at 100 gigabits per second. That's fast enough for video. So now quantum crypto is available commercially at high speed. Uh, and, and, and the, world rec the current record distance is more than 400 kilometers distance uh, done by Chinese, and Yanwei Pan in particular. Um, China also launched in August the first quantum satellite, quantum communication satellite, with which they, in they, ex they, they, ex they, they intend to do quantum cryptography over between Beijing and, and Vienna, for instance. So it's real, this is real. Quantum crypto is real. And, um, and therefore, since we get this, this unconditional perfect security with my definition of perfect, uh, back to the question who will win, looks like who was wrong. Code makers have won. Almost. <laughs> uh, well, the problem is, in really one more minute, the problem is that uh, what is proven secure Mathematically proven secure is the theoretical protocol that I invented with Bennett in 84. Uh, but when you implement it, including our implementation, uh, implement, implement, implementation or not as perfect as the, uh, as the idea. And, 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 and this guy, he does exist, called Vadim Makarov. Uh, and, and, and he's, uh, he, he built this little briefcase uh, that, that is a perfect quantum hacker, quantum hacker briefcase, and he goes from town to town, uh, plugging into quantum crypto apparatus and breaking it all over the place. It's, it, it's fun to, to see him go through airport security with that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so quantum crypto is perfect in theory. Uh, will it ever be built in a way that resists all possible uh, Makarovs, <laughs> uh, I don't know. So uh, maybe Poe was right after all, uh, that the code breakers would always win. But the, the, the game has shifted from mathematics to technology, uh, trying to build quantum crypto as close as possible to the ideal protocol on, for code makers and trying to tap onto the remaining imperfections for code breakers. And, and so the game of cat and mouse is not over. And, and back to the question at the beginning, we live in a quantum world. 
Uh, is that a blessing or a curse for crypto for coin makers? Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, that's my the only answer I can give is that we don't know yet. Uh, there, it, there are there's hope, there's hope, uh, but but no no clear proof yet that coin makers actually have one or will win. So maybe Paul was right. I hope not. All right. Uh, on this, uh, I thank you. <laughs>I definitely have a question. Um, your seven six, do you think that's the correct number or is it just the bound you could prove? Seven six. Um, all right, so at the moment, and the seven six is the best um, eavesdropping lower bound we have for classical code makers against quantum code breakers, which I think is the most interesting question. Um, we're able to raise it to n halves, and n to three halves, I'm sorry. We're able to raise it to, end, to, to as close to n to three half as you want if we don't care about time, if we care only about number of queries. Um, but the same trick, uh, send k instead of two. But um, if we care about time, I have no idea. I, 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 look, I, I don't believe that n to seven six can be the right answer. And, and earlier, in fact, our first breakthrough, if you allow me, uh, we were, the, the first time that we were able to provably get, get a protocol that classical against quantum was secure, secure, uh, we had n to the power 13 twelfth. So, so we went from 13 twelfth to 14 twelfth, other one known as 7 sixth. Uh, <laughs> which, I mean, if you had asked me before, do you believe that n to 13 twelfth can be the answer? I would have said no, and I would have been right. I would have been right. Uh, <laughs> But look, this, this, this seven, uh, seven six has been around now for, I think this was presented at Crypto 2011. We still have no, no clue how to do better. Okay. But I would very much welcome help. Thank you. Uh, are there any further questions? Oh, I will just carry the mic over to you, Debbie. <clears throat> so you do mention that you don't want to take side, uh, which way it goes. but. Do you really think it is a technological issue that may become fundamental, or you think quantum key distribution okay. probably can just be patched by better and better experiments? There, 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 okay, there, there are two, two approaches. One is to learn from the quantum hacking successful attacks and fix the apparatus, as you said, patch it, um, until Makarov finds a new vulnerability. vulnerability or someone else. Another approach is to find protocols that, by definition, withstand a wide class of attacks. And in particular, there is a, a, there's an approach known as measurement device independent quantum key distribution. Uh, and this does not be B84. So the protocol I invented in, with, with Bennett in 84 uh, I don't think well, I, I, I don't see how it could be built in a way that provably resists all possible attacks. So we have to find new protocols, in particular protocols based on entanglement. And the measurement device independent protocols, which have been implemented, in particular the 400 kilometers in China uses that, they are provably secure against any defects of the detectors. Even if the detectors are provided by the eavesdropper, they are still secure. Um, but they are not proven secure against possible defects of the source. Still, it's a good step. The next step is to have what's called fully device independent quantum key distribution, which would be provably secure against any defect of the detectors and, 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 and of the sources. It sounds kind of crazy, but, but there are ideas how to do that. However, these are completely impractical today. Uh, so is it only technology? If our technology gets sufficiently advanced that we can implement fully secure, fully device independent quantum key distribution, then on that day, the code makers will have one and it's finished until someone finds that quantum physics is wrong. <laughs> Thank you. So in, let's say that we have a world where uh, everybody has access to 
quantum computers and quantum communication channels. Uh -huh. uh, is there a place for mathematical encryption or like real time in real time communication? Uh, what's the real time about this? Like, let's say, uh, I want no, to qu connect. quantum crypto can be used in real time. Yeah, 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 but, but like, for example, if I want to uh, encrypt a, uh, a hard drive. Yeah, oh, 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 okay. Then that, that, that would be like a different thing. Uh -huh. uh, okay, so one, um, the game we played from the start, we being Charlie Bennett and me, uh, when we designed quantum crypto, was to invent a system that is technologically feasible today and unbreakable forever. So it was designed for the purpose of communication. If you want to use it for storage, if you want to use quantum crypto for storage instead of communication, it's, it's, it's a whole different game in terms of technology. You, you need to be able to store quantum bits and that stuff we don't know how to do today. So, um, uh, so, so please don't, 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 don't think that I, uh, I, I, I'm not saying that quantum crypto, once implemented properly, solve all, solves uh, the world's problems. <laughs> I'm not saying that. It does not do digital signatures. And, and current, I mean, classical crypto is used uh, for communication, for, yes, but it's even much, much more importantly used for digital signature, like sign, for instance, to make sure that that software updates are legitimate. Uh, I mean, the, the, greatest, the greatest thing that, that D.P. Hellman did uh, when he invented public cryptography was not encryption, it was signature, by far. And that's not given by quantum crypto. Not, that is not by quantum crypto distribution. Uh, so it does not solve all the problems. That's why we also need to work on post-quantum crypto. It's classical, and it could withstand a quantum attack. Uh, and in terms of, of encrypting on a disk, that's not even something that we're thinking about mm -hmm. uh, with quantum crypto. So, so we really need to have good classical techniques that can be quantum secure, knowing that we have no idea how to prove that they're quantum secure, at least not use those we know are not quantum secure. Thanks. Uh, maybe one more question. I was wondering if there are any implications of quantum cryptography for other uses of cryptography, things like blockchains or smart contracts and things right. like that? Uh, the answer is yes. Qu quantum cryptography, well, quantum information uh, can be used for a variety of cryptographic applications. And the first paper, the BB84 paper, if the first paper was Wiesner's, but, the, but in BB84, uh, of course, we, uh, in the 1984 paper, we explained how to do key distribution. In the same paper, we also explained how to do coin tossing, which is another application of classical cryptography. In fact, the uh, BB84 coin tossing was really a bit commitment protocol. And we also proved, showed how to break it at the time. <laughs> but at least the idea that you could do something else than just Communicate, class, communicate secret information was there from the start. Today, uh, we, we, we have all kinds of protocols to use quantum information for almost everything that classical crypto does. Uh, in some case, probably better than, than you can do classically without being perfect. In some case, perfect. Like key distribution is perfect. Uh, and, and by the way, it, Shannon proved that it's impossible. Shannon proved that without a secret key as long as a message, it's not possible to have perfect encryption. And Shannon's theorem is mathematically correct, but irrelevant. Because this theorem assumed in, in the proof, there was an, an implicit assumption that the eavesdropper can take down the message and let it go to, 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 to Bob. And, and there's a specific line in Shannon's proof that's just wrong. Not mathematically, but physically wrong. Uh, and that's why quantum key distribution can make it possible to, to, to have perfect secrecy without needing a secret key as long as the message. So in some cases, you can probably get something using quantum information that is better than anything possible that's classically possible. In, and, 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 in, and in, in fact, it's perfect if you have a perfect implementation. In other cases, like big commitment coin tossing, 
You can do better than possible than, than was classically possible, provably so again, although you cannot do it perfectly. Uh, in the case of digital signature, I'm less convinced that you can do. I mean, there, there have been proposed schemes for digital for quantum signatures, but nothing has convinced me as being at least practical. Um, so uh, across the board of, of all the, the theory of cryptography that has been developed essentially since D.V. Hellman in, in academia, with all kinds of ideas coming out, like multi-party computation, uh, anonymous networks, so many, many ideas have been developed in, cla in the classical world of cryptography. Each of these questions can be readdressed using quantum information. In some cases, we get perfect solutions, which were not possible, to, which were not possible classically. In some cases, we, can, we get something better than possible classical without being perfect. In some cases, we get nothing. But, but it's, it's a very, very wide field. Right. Here, I, I concentrated on key distribution, key establishment, but there's a lot more. Thanks. Good question. OK, well, uh, I think we'll wrap it up there. Uh, as usual, there's a reception right across the hall uh, starting right now. Uh, and so I'll ask you to join me in thanking our speaker again.